Hello, gypsy motherfuckers. Welcome back to Fyros' story time with me, Fyros. Oh, and I'm in a very Fyros-y kind of place today. Uh, not today. Now. Right now. Um, you will notice if you've been following my channel for a while that I'm in a different place to where I was on the last few videos. I was kind of in an aquasy type place um, in the last few videos, but my hair, for one thing, says that I'm in a fire ice mode because I cannot get it to fucking go down. It won't. It's just saying, go up, go up, go up, and I can't fucking bring it down. Um, and I've just gone through a very strange experience where, because, right, so on my channels, I've got a lot of different channels. I've got, like, seven channels and the thing with them as well is that when they're called channels but I feel like I'm actually channeling different parts of myself when I'm doing them so the fire rush channel is this part of me and then we've got Aquas who's a very different part of myself a very different character a very kind of different um energy that comes through with Aquas and then you've got um Budos, um, Eros, Sea Eros, Earthos, um, Son of Gaia, <laughs> and Ross Alastair Wilson, which is my kind of like uh, my true self channel, which is where I'm most clear and most me and least emotionally turbulent and least directional as well. So I'm like kind of is. Ross Alastair Wilson is me when I am in the director's chair of my whole sort of of my whole life. So whatever it is that I'm thinking about when I'm in the director's seat of, okay, I mean I'm the, I'm the boss. You know, let's push the little characters around and tell them right. Bulos is going to do this stuff, and I'll do this stuff with Earthos, and then I'm going to do this in Fireos mode and. Aquas, so what the hell is going on with Aquas? Whatever. So that's that's Ross Alastair Wilson, and Ross Alastair Wilson seems to be interested in films and um, computer games. So the reason uh, that all of these characters have even come about was through I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I started off as Fire Ross, right? I created this name Fire Ross, and it was a redefining of my character for myself. I wanted to break away from my past at a certain point in my history, which was the 2014 break-off point that I keep mentioning in videos. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to break off from my past as being Ross Alastair Wilson because Ross Alastair Wilson, the name and the whole being I was, was someone who I didn't want to be anymore and who I felt that that name just had so many associations to it that to even call myself that name brought up the feeling of the old self if that makes sense so the Ross uh, Ross Alistair Wilson or even just Ross Wilson it also uh, like I did a lot of publicity about mental health stuff um, we did my dad and I did talks um, to schools and to some mental health conventions about psychosis and our experience my experience, my dad's experience of me going through what was termed psychosis, which I'm still not entirely sure what I want to refer to that thing as, but we'll call it psychosis still. I'll call it my spiritual adventure, spiritual journey adventure through psychosis, maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of publicity trying to raise mental health awareness, and then my own awareness began to rise up again because I had some therapy, some counselling, right? And and something was born, reborn. No, not even reborn. Something was just born anew, to something that had never been there before, which was a part of me that I was standing up for myself all of a sudden. And I was creating my own life. Whereas before, before that point of 2014, um, I wasn't creating my own life. I was, I was creating a life within systems, um, family systems, and trying to fit into the society systems, jobs, you know, career paths, stuff like that. Um, 
I was trying to fit myself into what was already existing. And then when I broke away from that and I released a hell of a lot of codependent patterns around my family and also between myself and society as a whole, and I became much more um, my own person, my own being, my own my own self, my own um, my own sort of self governing entity. I think is what I could say. Um, when I did that, it it was such a kind of dramatic change for me that I felt like I had to name it something different. I felt like I had to give a name, give myself a new name, like rename myself, because I just felt like I wasn't that old person anymore. Ross, the Ross person was just this kind of feeling of depression is what I got about being Ross. You know, all that Ross had known for the past 10 years in his life was depression and madness and being labelled by society and judged by society and not fitting in with the society. So, yeah. Um, so all these characters... So I began with Fyros, and then I don't know how exactly Aquos came about. I remember speaking about Aquos with um, uh, my most recent ex-girlfriend and one of my... Um, Ex friends, I guess. I I don't know. I I don't know if we are still friends or not. <laughs> uh, I probably would say hello to him and still talk to him. We, we don't have any beef. I'm not in contact with him because he's going through some. Well, last time I saw him, he seemed to have turned into a druggie and an alcoholic, and was going through some real rough times to the point that I and like mental health wise, he wasn't really engaging with reality on a level that I could engage with him. So. I kind of feel like, actually, I feel like I should feel guilty for not spending time with him anymore. But there's a part of me that's just like, I'm not going to get anything from that. And I am not being, I'm not going to be able to offer him anything either. Um, and it's just going to piss me off to be around him. So I'm just going to leave him and wait for him to kind of find his way again. Because I, I don't need that. You know, he called me up and he's just talking shit down the phone angry shit at me about this that and the other and I'm like I don't need this in my life anymore um you know so I just kind of let him go I feel like I'll still be friends with him and it, he'll come back around at some point you know I'm, I'm hoping that he kind of gets better but I realize that I can't actually help him either I cannot actually help him get better I can't help him any more than I already had and I helped him for ages um, just by being support. And I felt like I couldn't even offer that support anymore. So that was a shame. Anyway, uh, yeah. But so I remember talking about Aquos as a new character and then so, like starting to sort of design these elemental characters. So Fyros, I'd, I'd originally thought that like Fyros would be the be all and end all. You know, that's going to be the only one. But I realised that I had this conflict as well with the name, like calling myself Fyros to people when I met them wasn't going down well at all. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, so what's your real name then? I'd be like, it's, a, it's, it's as a real name as any other name. But that wasn't going down either. And then I had this strange thing where, so some people would respect the fact that I've decided to change my name to Fyros and they'd call me Fyros. And then most people wouldn't buy into it and wouldn't accept it and they would just call me Ross. So I had this thing where, most people would call me Ross and a few select people who bought into that or, or just accepted me as being Fire Ross would call me Fire Ross. And I would love it when they call me Fire Ross. Um, but it was so rare. I'd kind of go, what? Oh, God, yeah, they call me Fire Ross. So they, they, they see me as Fire Ross, which is like awesome because the whole point of calling myself Fire Ross was for me to give myself the opportunity to define who I was rather than previously being defined by the society that I found myself in, the family I found myself in, you know, the friendships I found myself in and wasn't exercising any discernment or critical judgment about how do I want to direct my life? How do I want to respond to these people? How do I want to uh, manage my own relationships and manage my own work? Um, because the, like, prior to that point, prior to me creating Firos as a new identity for myself, as I say, I was always trying to fit my feelings and thoughts and ideas into systems and 
understandings that were already there and finding that I just didn't fit with it. And therefore, it was making me really unhappy. Um, yeah, so Aquas just kind of started to develop as an idea, as a potential next person. And I told a couple of people that I changed my name to Aquas now. And I said, yeah, I'm a water dwelling Pokemon. <laughs> I'm a water type Pokemon now. I was a fire type Pokemon. Now I'm a water Pokemon. And then I kind of started playing with the idea of the different elements. Um, and uh, because I've been into spiritual healing and stuff for a long time. Um, and something just calls to me about magic and elements. Um, I feel that I feel like the elements go very deep, so they're quite archetypal. I really like the feeling of these different elements because fire has so many different properties to it. Um, but in terms of what it can do, how it feels, you know, it's it's kind of. Uh, the fact that it can destroy and yet be really, really warming. The fact that it can ruin a forest with a forest fire, but then actually that's a rejuvenating thing for the forest. Um, the fact that it can kill people and burn people, yet it also keeps houses warm and it heats food. It's just a very kind of like, whoa, um, strong archetypal um, element which I'm I was interested in, and when I first created the Pharos name, um, the letters all mean something in particular, apart from maybe the F. <laughs> uh, well, fire, but spelled differently: F I E R, fire, and then O S. So, so I managed to keep some part of the original Ross. I wanted to pay homage to where I'd come from, but I wanted the name to be overall new and different. So it's kind of like saying, I acknowledge where I've come from. I'm not leaving that entirely behind, but I am saying that I define myself now. I am in the driving seat. I control my own self. Um, and I set my own rules for how I interact with people. Like I understand that I can't control people. I understand that to try and control people or manipulate people is wrong. I also know that I need to get my needs met and I need to um, live my life in a way that I feel has integrity to me and that I feel passionate about and that is self-directed. And sometimes that involved me clashing up against people. So I decided that I had to kind of make rules for how I was going to deal with other people. Um, so it wasn't about like, how am I going to control other people? It's like, no, how am I going to respond to myself? What do I accept? What do I not accept? Um, and, and it's like, if someone speaks to me like this, I decide to respond in this way. These are my rules for myself. And I created a whole new kind of way of responding to my family mainly but also to friends but it, it wasn't kind of perfect it didn't I, I never felt 100% settled on it and it evolved and changed over time and I think that that is where the other elements started to come into play more as well so you got Aquas came along um, because I think like Aquas developed because there was a need for me to soften down and to calm down from all the fieriness, you know. Uh, Fyros, um, my first incarnation as Fyros, because obviously I'm reborn now, uh, so I'm a slightly different version of Fyros now. Um, <laughs> right now, I mean, like right now, here and now. I don't mean overall, because that's why I was just how I began the video. Like, I feel like I've got all these little fucking elements having a fucking argument in me at the moment. Like, Aquas and Fyros are really struggling at the moment. Like, Aquas wants to have supremacy <laughs> in the soul. And then Fyros has suddenly come back. And I'm like, oh my god, as Fyros, where the hell have I been? Because I've been living as Aquas for ages. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell was that? Like, where have I been? The, the real me, which Fyros, obviously, as Fyros, I believe I'm the real me. Um, and when I'm Aquas, I part of Aquas believes that he's the real, he's the real person, he's the real deal. Um, he's more, he feels like he's more himself than I am myself. If that makes sense. So it's it's bizarre. It's like 
I wouldn't say it's to the point of being personality disorder type of thing. I'd say it's a it's a personality melee. It's a personality party, babies. You know, it's everyone's having a good time in here in some way and, and messing around in there. Um, and the the good thing about having all these different personality expressions within me is that I do have some level of choice as to who do I want to bring out. And it's good because each um, elemental kind of personality type inside me is useful for different scenarios. Firos is very good at being angry, boundary setting, confront, um, making things happen, making a difference, changing things, making life decisions, um, defining things, creating things in a kind of frenzied storm of energy. And then Aquas is more... Uh, it's hard for me to talk about Aquas because I'm really in a Firos type of mode. But Aquas is... Uh, I mean, I see him as a bit of a bell end because I'm Firos right now. <laughs> but Aquas is... Uh, I can't talk about him, okay? I don't know anything about him. He's a loser. I mean, what the fuck? Uh, he's like over there somewhere. He doesn't really kind of exist at this moment. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Um... Yeah, but the good thing about all these different elements is that they are they have their own time, their own place, and their own say, and they're like they're all um, useful in a creative sense, and also just useful in my life overall because I'm aware that, for example, Firos doesn't go very well in my family, <laughs> but Aquas works brilliantly in my family. Like, Aquas is marvellous in my family. There, he's just coming out a bit there. Aquas, uh, Aquas can very much listen to other people, and Aquas is non-confrontational. Uh, oh, I know about him now, do I? Okay, fair enough. Aquas doesn't um, doesn't get riled by anything. Um, Fyros gets riled by things really easily. Like, Fyros, I just want to, like, yeah, fucking stab someone in the face with a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one of the things that Firos does as well. Firos has this thing where he kind of, I mean, I kind of, whatever. Who cares? Where we, uh, Venom, where we, um, I've lost it now. I've lost the plot. I've lost myself. I'm gone. And we have this thing where I can be angry as Firos, but then I have to make it funny as well. Uh, Firos is a little bit afraid of his own power and his own anger. So that's something that we have to deal with in therapy. <laughs> together yeah anyway uh, let's check the video time and yes we've got loads of time left i'm excited about this so that's just a little bit of uh, how outquest and virus are getting on at the moment they're having a fight inside me that is the case and i don't, I don't even really know why that is um i feel like it could be because i've given my dad a book uh, that i've written called eggs it's not complete yet but um it's all about all my different characters. So all my different characters are basically having loads of different discussions and being put in different scenarios. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, why am I laughing? You don't know why it's funny. I find it funny. Um, what am I talking about? I don't know. Oh, come on, fire us, old boy. Do, 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 do. Nope. It's gone. I've lost my flame. I've been snuffed out. I actually have, though. I've gone blank. Eggs. Yeah. <laughs> so, eggs. So, um, I gave my book to my dad. I gave my dad my book. I gave my book to my dad. I gave the book to my dad. I gave my dad my book. Oi, 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 I haven't seen that film split, but I've seen the trailer and I'm guessing that this is what it's like. <sighs> so. Oh, yeah. So I gave my dad the book Eggs. Eggs. And in there, as I was saying just a minute ago, before I randomly lost my train of thought. <laughs> choo choo. Yeah. What am I talking about? Oh, my God. What is going on with this? So I gave my book to the dad. Gave my book my eggs book to my dad, right? And I feel like maybe he read a little bit of it or something and 
I like psychically or something that's affected me and like because in the book the characters of Aquas and Fyros are in conflict because one is made of fire and one is made of water. I'm made of fire. Motherfucker Aquas keeps trying to put me out, put my flame out, right? And it's, it's a kind of funny dynamic. They're like the odd couple, you know, <laughs> fire and water. What could be a more chalk and cheese, eggs and chicken, f- fish and fish and r- red currants. What could be, sorry, I got taken over there by a, Water demon. Um, what could be more? I've lost my fucking train of thought again. What's going on? <laughs> anyway, okay, so maybe this discussion is not going anywhere. Let's try and go back to the actual fucking story. So I keep talking about Mr. B. Um, yeah, and what else is there to say about him? So I was talking about the Book of Secrets. I'm rereading the Book of Secrets at the moment by Deepak Chopra. Um, I'm rereading it. Yeah, so I'm rereading that book uh, all the way through so that I... Mm, come on, what is with my brain? I'm reading the book all the way through so that I can make sure that I have read every single word of it. I'm having a hard time here. Uh, okay. And, aha, so we had the death spasm, didn't we, from yesterday. Um, Mr. B spasmed. He had a death spasm. Death spasm. He didn't actually die himself, as you well know. But he uh, he did freak out about death, the, the fact that it exists and stuff, and that it's a thing. Um... Uh, yeah, so he, um, oh man, I really am going blank just now. So, uh, maybe we've run out of stuff to talk about on him. I mean, I broke up with him. We know about that. I got the book f- called A New Earth from my brother for Christmas 2006. Yeah, because he said, hey, you want to change the world and stuff? Uh, Here's this book. Because it says on the cover of it, it says, A New Earth, Create a Better Life or something like that. Or Create a Better World. I can't remember. Um, So he, my brother, bought me this book by Eckhart Tolle because uh, I think he saw it just from the cover and from the back. He saw it as tying into my environmentalism. I think that's really what it was. He thought that it would, like it was kind of relevant to my environmental type of stuff. But it was more relevant to my spiritual type of stuff, which I think I must have had Deepak Chopra's book first. I think I picked up the Book of Secrets first because we discussed that in the last video where I saw it in the bookshop. Bookshop! Um, I saw it in the bookshop in Reading with Mr. B, with me, um, Mr. B, what a stupid name, yeah, uh, yeah, so I bought that book, and then, Well, I was reading it a lot. Ah, so I was trying to talk last time about um, some of the stuff that I read in the book that I was applying to the relationship I was in. And there was parts about manipulation. Um, So there's this part, and I've just recently read it now, actually, so that's interesting. Um, There's these parts uh, about how our fear of death leads us to try different coping strategies and one of them is manipulation and control and denial um yeah and i remember reading through those parts and feeling like i could apply it to my boyfriend at the time um i really want to say his name 
I don't think I should say his second name, but I want to say his first name instead of calling him Mr. B. But it also is it's like sort of stuck there. It doesn't want to come out fully yet, so we'll just leave it for the moment. But it does feel childish to be calling him Mr. B. I mean, who fucking knows? It could be anyone called Charlie. <gasps> yeah. It could be anyone called Charlie. Charlie. His name is Charlie. Charlie. I said it. It could be anyone. It's just a person called Charlie. Oh my god, that's a kind of relief. Um, so I remember reading this book to Charlie. Or not reading it, but like showing him it or something. Because we had this shared journal, actually. Because we were aware that we had problems. We were aware that our relationship was rocky and shitty. Shitty and rocky and fucky and bollocksy. Um, I did not fuck him up the arse more than once or twice. No, I did fuck him up the arse. He didn't fuck me up the arse. Sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, I had an issue with that. Uh, I wasn't happy about that. So I, I tried it and then just abandoned it like... Mm. Um, it's not happening, I don't want to do it. Um, which he was a bit unhappy about because he wasn't getting the pleasure from that. But I just, I couldn't, didn't feel like it and it felt like I wasn't willing to try again. Oh man, my head is going really weird with all this fire stuff going on right now. Um... Okay, so I remember showing him this manipulation part and trying to get through to him to show him that he had been behaving in manipulative um, and controlling and denying ways. And he wouldn't accept it. And then he finally did accept it and understand a little bit. And we had this talk where I... I said to him something like, you know, you don't really say sorry. You don't ever say sorry. You you kind of you do bad things um, and say bad things and mean things or whatever, and then you don't ever apologize. Like, what's that? Why is that? Um, and he said something like he was afraid of being seen as weak. Um, and yeah, so we had a little moment there. Um, I that. Uh, I got the first apology out of him that I'd ever had in the whole relationship. Which was like two years into the relationship. And this was actually around the time that I was breaking up with him. Uh, or near to that time, anyway. Because more and more, as I was reading this book, Deepak Chopra's Book of Secrets book, the more and more I read this book, I realised that Charlie wasn't the one for me. That, that there was something wrong and that there was something wrong overall about being in a gay relationship for me. I just felt like that was not co correct to my soul. That was not kind of accurate, if that makes sense. It wasn't true. It wasn't right. It didn't feel like the truth of myself. Yeah. It felt like, um, it felt like I was trying to be something I wasn't, basically. So... And I'd had this growing awareness uh, coming to me. That I sort of had these thoughts in the back of my head of like, I'm not gay, actually. Um, and I want to be with a woman. And I don't really enjoy being with Charlie. And I don't really enjoy gay sex. And um, so that awareness was in the background. It felt like it was kind of at the back of my mind. And somehow it just hadn't come to the foreground, uh, foreground yet. But as I read this book, it asked me various questions. And as I was asking them, uh, answering them by sort of listening to myself and thinking to myself about the answers and stuff. Um, I It was kind of like bringing things that were at the back of my mind, bringing them forward so that I could actually hear them more clearly. Because my thoughts, um, I don't know. I don't know if you've had this experience ever. I feel like it's a quite subtle experience to describe how you've got kind of different layers of your mind and how you may be operating out of like a surface level of your mind and not paying attention to stuff that's more quiet in the background. Um, 
so I had this experience of being aware that okay, so the stuff on the the surface of my mind was at one level, but that there was also kind of further back to get to, if that makes sense. There was, there was deeper to go to, in understanding myself, um, and that's strange because it's it's kind of hard to explain how you discern that or how I discerned it anyway that it's almost like there are different that the mind <laughs> sorry and the brain and the head the mind brain head space is is like a cavern or like a a room of some kind um and or or a landscape of some sort depending on how expansive it feels in there Man, that's a stinky fart. You are lucky you don't have smell of vision. Ah, oh, jeez. Yeah. And, like, most of the time, I think we're preoccupied with the stuff that's, like, really up close at the, at the front of the cave or wherever it is on the screen of, like, a, I don't know, some projector. <laughs> and then you realize that there's actually other shit in there that you, you didn't know was there. Um, because quite often the front of the mind is so busy with stuff, thinking about stuff, like usually to do with doing things and um, worrying about things tends to be that sort of stuff or decision making of some kind. And then um, there's way more stuff in the mind that to bubble up, like memories and traces of perception and thinking and like deeper deeper understandings that can have a more profound impact on your surface level mind but also like how you live through your life even so if you get further back into your understanding of yourself go deeper inside the mind and deeper inside your your heart and your body um i just want to talk about the mind though because i think the mind is um easier for me to talk about right now i don't really understand the heart uh the heart i don't really understand that i can't really seem to talk about what that is um i feel it but i can't really articulate it very well um yeah so the mind like there are deeper layers in the mind to get to and some of them are hidden from you while you're preoccupied with all the stuff at the forefront which tends to be as i said to do with the physical world to do with doing things um uh, judgments choices um, whether you like this thing or don't like this thing um what you want to do, what you don't want to do in a kind of habitual way, which is mainly like just societal conditioning. But then there are these deeper layers, right? And I felt like reading this book was helping me to bring some of those background layers forward and to be able to hear those things a bit more clearly. Because those things I felt were having an impact anyway, but I just wasn't able to sift them sift um sort of hear them clearly it's like i wasn't able to hear my own self clearly enough because there was so much chatter going on in my mind all the time so much thinking excess thinking worrying concerns you know uh, and just like a constant stream of stuff i will say another few things actually because i had um these amazing experiences every now and again maybe every other night or every two or three nights before i would go to sleep uh, as I was just drifting off to sleep, I would have this most beautiful classical music create itself in my mind. And I mean, like, it would just start playing. It would just start creating itself in my mind. Not anything I'd ever heard. I was aware that I was both creating it and listening to it at the same time. And it's just kind of like, mainly strings. It was a string. It was always strings, like these sort of like fully formed orchestral melodies going on in my head and unfortunately not having ever been trained to write music down um as in apart from like very very basic stuff i would listen to the stuff in my head and go oh my god that's amazing and then there would be nothing i could do about it afterwards and also i would forget it really really quickly I would occasionally, I think, 
do I had this dictaphone I always had a dictaphone on me at all times I was like really big into my music at that time and I was always recording every idea oh my god this feels like some forgotten lifetime that I had completely forgotten about um but I mean I kind of lived that same life uh it's just the paraphernalia was different. You know, I still use my voice notes thing on my phone to record ideas. And I've been doing that same, it's the same process, but it just feels very different now um, to how I used to. Like before I was really, really invested in everything, really enthusiastic, like really kind of dedicated to this whole process. Um, in a way that I feel that I feel like a sense of loss around, but I'm not as into my music as I used to be. I mean, and I'm not, as um focused on it like i'm not very determined either i just kind of it's got a hell of a lot easier as well so i don't have to do all this kind of stuff and i've noticed that i don't have to be concerned about coagulating collecting ideas because what i have noticed is the best ideas tend to stay around and i tend to to kind of mull them over for longer um and if they stay around and I continue wanting to play them, then they're the good ones. Because what I had this problem with at that early age in life was I just thought everything I did was a possible genius thing and a possible amazing thing. And as I was creating it, I always thought had the sense of this is amazing. And a lot of it was cool, but it's I I'm I don't know, I feel a bit of a loss actually around those things. Because there, there is something that I've lost. I have lost um, a sense of enthusiasm about my music. I have. I've lost a sense of that connection to the thrill of improvising um, music when I was busking. I used to improvise. The first thing I would do when I'd like bust out doing some busking on the um, high street thing of Windsor, uh, Pescott Street in Windsor, the first thing I would do was I would improvise for a while on my acoustic guitar with my little amp. And I would just mess about, like, creating some riffs and stuff, usually in drop D, but not always in drop D. And I would just be improvising and, and enjoying the experience of improvising. But I feel like something in the whole atmosphere of the whole world actually has really dramatically changed since I first started busking. I mean, um, I feel like the world is less safe now in my own experience i feel like people are more aggressive on the streets i feel scared more um and i don't know if it's because i've been through a lot of shit over the time that i'm more sensitive to those things maybe those things were there all along and i just didn't see them and maybe i'm creating more of a darker understanding of the world because of the experiences i've gone through are now coloring how i see the world that's quite possible and probably is very very possible but i also i also think that there's something that has happened in the world overall like i don't know things just seem very different with all the different technologies that have come around recently with the internet um with the internet becoming so big and so heavily used and computers becoming so um complex and then uh, the political s political environment seems to change so rapidly um at the moment you know um it has been changing in, in very rapid ways i mean the amount of different prime ministers we've had uh it seems very strange i don't know i don't know because didn't David Cameron... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It just seems to have all happened very, very quick. Lots of different things have happened very quickly over the last few years. Um, at a rate that I feel was quicker than it used, like, kind of used to be. Um, but then that's maybe just my perception of time is changing. Who knows? I don't know. It's difficult to understand. I'm trying to pinpoint why I feel like there's this kind of sense of darkness going on in the atmosphere overall. Um, and like, I look back at those memories from be like busking on the street and I was younger then. Yeah, fine. But I was actually kind of, I mean, I was 21. So 
those memories seem really, really bright. Like the atmosphere at that time was really bright. Um, compared with when I've got memories from being on the streets busking five years ago and like the, the, the memories there are confused, um, dull, dark. I get the sense of coldness, windiness, you know, rough, being beaten up, um, danger, um, being uh, t told to move along a hell of a lot more than ever before. Um, like more of a sense of fear from the customer, less money as well, um, less enjoyment, feeling like it was a slog. Uh, compared with when I first started out, where I think some of those things were there, but mostly it was kind of like quite a happy feeling being on the street busking. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I had these like music things creating themselves in my brain, which was amazing. And I was just so gutted that I couldn't tap into it fully. Um, but it's so beautiful because it wasn't only the music I would hear, but the feelings that came with it was really peaceful, blissful, joyous, um, very subtle uh, sort of magic. But magic's not the right word. Uh, kind of entering this different world of music, basically. Like It was like the music was there and it was creating itself and it was very beautiful and peaceful sounding music but also it was as though I was the music as well so it was that merging of my mind with the music so I could sense that that um, my mind had become the music and it was it was almost like the notes were tangible if that makes sense so it kind of had an energy to it as well um, it was like dream yeah so imagine being in a dream you know when you're in your dream things seem very real but in a different way to how they are real in this waking life so this were like music dreams where i was just going off to sleep i go into the pre-sleep dream state where you're kind of half between awake and asleep hypnagogic state i believe it's called and it's as though i would slip into the state where my dream was composed of music it was just a music the the music was the dream and i'd entered into this music realm <laughs> and then i would occasionally come out and wake up from that instead of going to sleep i'd come back out and I'd go oh my god i just had this that amazing music dream thing again um and remember a little bit of it but then it would fade so quickly so it's such a shame um yeah thinking back to that time now I was so creative, way more creative than I am now with music. Um, and also my comedy, I was way more creative with my comedy at the time. So those are things that have been lost. Um, but now my phase is that I'm really, really creative with writing. And I'm also really, really creative with my artwork. And I'm also finishing a hell of a lot more work and in fact I have finished more work than I've ever finished before in terms of books and artwork pieces maybe even songs in the last year or two than I have ever finished in my whole entire career of being a creator or of some kind but something feels lost, though, even in that, even in all this creative activity, something feels lost. It feels like it feels like I'm just running out a certain phase in my life. It feels like I'm just kind of running out a certain energy feeling that needs to come out of me. Um, and it's like I'm not really genuinely. This is it. I'm not really genuinely enthusiastic about anything I'm doing. Really, that's the truth. I'm not genuinely enthusiastic about my art. Okay, I'm interested in my artwork. Um, I'm interested in it. And I kind of enjoy it ish here and there. But it's more of a state of, I feel like I'm just slogging through it. I feel like I'm just plowing through these projects that I feel, if I don't do them, 
I will, it's not even though I'll regret it, I'll just feel tense. I need to get these projects out. So it's more a sense of necessity, emotional necessity. And then once I get it done, I will feel relieved and uh, something will lift and burdens are lifting slowly as I do these projects anyway. Um, but I really do feel like something genuine has been lost. Something has been lost um, in my songwriting and yeah, in my artwork as well. I mean, it's just like, I'm just doing stuff. I'm just doing stuff. It's not like I really, um, I think I don't believe in it, basically. I'm doing it because I need to do it, but I don't invest in it in the same way that I used to, which is a shame because that's that loss. I've lost that kind of deep appreciation for what I'm doing. I mean, I appreciate my art and my art's amazing compared with how it used to be. My art is in the best state that it's ever been. My book writing is in the best state that it's ever been. Okay. Um, everything is way better in terms of quality than it's ever been. But something's missing. <laughs> something's missing. And it's the, the juice of it. The, the kind of uh, creative enthusiasm is lost and it has been lost for a while. Um, and I think that what's missing probably is stand-up comedy and performing music live. Because music is a real emotional thing for me. When I play music live, it's very passionate. Um, and I just connect into a whole nother emotional place inside me that I can't seem to connect in any other arena apart from maybe when I'm having counselling. I get to this emotional place. I mean, even in these video series, this video series of Fire Storytime, I haven't connected to the emotion, barring on a few occasions, probably when I've had a few to drink as well. So I find getting to the emotional place quite difficult. But music helps me get to that place. Playing music and listening to some music as well um, helps me get to that. But really playing music and singing with all my heart really does that. And then stand-up comedy. The thing, the thing that I have lost by not doing stand-up comedy is a sense of spontaneity of spontaneity of character and spontaneity of enjoyment. And and there's also a sense of like attention as well that I get from stand-up comedy the feeling of being having fun while gaining attention from other people but what happened with stand-up comedy is that I felt overwhelmed at a certain point with attention um, and I suddenly became really attention shy um, and I became sensitive way more sensitive than ever before to the feeling of rejection um, I think that happened when I came off the antidepressant medication uh something just opened up this massive wound opened up that i didn't realize was even there um and it was like this wound in my chest here was suddenly amazingly raw and sensitive to rejection like now meh, i'm not sensitive for rejection hardly at all okay a little bit every now and again i get pissed at, at something but um yeah so so something's been lost it's like, it, it's a kind of clarity of enjoyment, a clarity of enthusiasm, and a clarity of um, enthusiasm, like enthusiasm. The enthusiasm has been lost, basically. There's something, something of my soul has died around my artwork and my music and my comedy and my videos and just everything. You know, something has been lost possibly in the process of working at it so hard that some have sucked the juice out of it for myself somehow that I just worked it to death and I'm burnt out from it again mm. so Charlie Mr. B the name Charlie, Mr. B. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I called him Mr. B, I used to call Charlie Charlie Boy and sometimes Charlie B, Mr. B. So it was Charlie B, Charlie Boy. Did I call him Charlie B? I don't know. Charlie Boy, Charlie B. Yeah. <clears throat> Charlie. 
Yeah, it's weird because saying the name doesn't give the same effect that it used to. I used to, the name used to really refer to something, but I feel as though I've kind of taken out all the problem around that person's name and around that person himself because of all the work that I've been doing in the videos. Yeah. I wish that was more triumphant than that. <laughs> it's been hard work. Um, so I broke up with him. Uh, Charlie, Mr. B. I feel like calling him Mr. B now. I think we're doing better with calling him Mr. B. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I broke up with him. Then I moved back home. Uh, maybe I should talk a bit. I'm still trying to clear out some of these old memories about being with him, Charlie, the guy. So I want to repeat briefly the fact that he trapped me in a hotel room. Uh, briefly, um, he wouldn't let me read books. He threw the controller around the TV remote. He wanked off to one of my videos of me in my band playing a gig, which I found really weird at the time. I found it gross that he would do that without my permission or without telling me or something um, in advance. I found it weird and gross that he wanked over me. But I don't find that weird now. I mean, anyone fucking wank over me all your life. I don't care. But something was strange about it that time. I don't know why I either. Why I found that upsetting. And I was really pissed at him. I was really upset that he had... Um, it's like he was taking something from me. That's what it was. It was like he was... Because he'd done it secretly. And he hadn't he hadn't done it and, uh, and told me before uh, or anything. Um, and he kind of... I had the sensation he was trying to take something from me or he was objectifying me in some way and idolizing me in a way and in a disconnected way that I didn't like. And I was like, I don't want you to do that. Like, don't do that. It just feels creepy and it feels like you're idolizing me um, too much. And you're also like kind of getting off on, getting off on me in some idolizing way which is just I don't know I, I was really upset with him for doing that and then oh god so there are other things as well this controlling side of him where he wouldn't let me do various things I mentioned about the hair cutting thing he didn't want me to cut my hair for charity because uh because he was afraid that he wouldn't find me attractive, basically. And he was always telling me I was ugly as well, which wasn't nice. And he said that, well, I didn't go out with you for your looks. And I was like, thanks very much. You're just basically calling me ugly. Um, like, the guy was fucking insecure, man. So he would just take his insecurities out on me. Ugh. I'm sure I was a dick as well about certain things. I can't remember right now. <sighs> um, what else is there to clear up? Uh, so I was really into uh, poetry and lyrics. Okay, so here we go. I had this little folder, a little bit like this, actually. Uh, is it like that? Not really. Well, similar to that. One of these little organizer type folders, like a ring binder folder of that size. And I had loads of different um, sections in there. One was comedy, one was poetry and lyrics, one was stories or something, and one was cartoons. And I so I used to buy lined refill type pads of paper and plain paper to stick in those, stick in there. And so I drew my little comic um cartoons in there and wrote lyrics in there i was trying to be really organized about all my different creative disciplines um and but another thing was i could <laughs> i was always having difficulty as to whether i was what is this thing is this going to be poetry is it going to be lyrics is uh, what section should it be in is it partly comedy is it color is it comedy poem what uh, uh, Categorization I found quite difficult. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. He. 
um, did a lot of recording for me as a mixing person on the computer. Um, I had a little what's that thing called mixing desk and an interface uh, USB sound card for the computer on an old PC that I don't have anymore. Or well, maybe we do have actually. It's around somewhere. Yeah, and he used to record the stuff and help me um, mix things. So we were a little creative team there together. Um, because he idolized me so much and wanted to help me so much that he, he basically was my creative director in some ways. He was always trying to help me and I was often finding him to be meddling and pushing me too much and trying to have influence and things in ways that I just wanted him to leave it out, like leave me alone. I just want to have it for myself. Um, but he was there when I recorded my first album. He came to the studio uh, when I was recording my first album um, a couple of times. And I was living with him when I was recording that. Um, pardon me. Ah, he even features in the liner notes. Which is a shame. <laughs> I wish I hadn't put him in there. It's fucking annoying. Because I'm so... Oh, what's not in there? <laughs> Don't have the front cards in this one. Oh, well. Um, yeah. So I wrote a bit about him in there, saying thank you to him for all his love and support and bollocks like that. Because I was young and optimistic and thinking I was going to be famous and that he would want to be a credit in there because I was going to be famous and so he would want to be famous and <laughs> oh man yeah all right so I did some of the rehearsals for the oh my god there's so much to say now that I fucking thought of it we did some of the rehearsals for that album in Charlie's dad's studio um not a music studio a art art and design studio um, which was an old building that he had some offices in and we basically just used one of these um, rooms in an office space to put a drum kit in and I played guitar with my drummer in there to um, get him up to speed on some of the songs that we were going to record for the album so Charlie's dad was quite no that's going to turn into a poo if I try and squeeze that far out <sighs> Charlie's dad was accepting and allowed me to use his studio free of charge. Oh, Lord. Um, I also had this little room that was designated for me to use to do creative stuff in, which I wanted for me to use to do creative stuff in, but I actually ended up doing hardly anything in because it was a mess and... Um, I did sit in there and do some painting and stuff once, but I think I felt just a bit kind of lonely. And I don't think I liked the atmosphere. It was quite dusty in there. Um, I did some stuff in there, but I don't know. Something just felt odd being in there. The whole thing felt odd. The whole scenario with the relationship felt odd. I felt so fucking lonely. Like I was so isolated. You know, nowadays, I like having my own time. But then a days, those were the days when I was alone. Not really because I wanted to be, but because I'd been isolated. Yeah. And, oh my God, I need to poo. So, bye. Fucking hell.